Hello everyone, it's been a while, and that's on me, just like always. Today we're going to talk about core gameplay and how it is important in your design process and you should use it. So you should definitely watch this video, just like you should watch all of them, like, comment, and subscribe. Okay, bye. So this video is going to be cut into four sections because core gameplay is one of those very much like e easier said than done situations and I'm going to try to really get at something that's useful for you in like less than 15 minutes. So I'm going to break it down and we're going to try to go through it as quickly as possible but also try to get down to the good stuff. So the four sections are introduction to core gameplay, what that means, what it is. We're going to talk about uh, when to use it and when not to use it as a single section. Then we're going to talk about how to use it and how not to use it. And then the final section, the fourth section, will be how to use it for playtesting and how to iterate on it so that you're moving forward in your process even if you didn't get things right the first time, which you absolutely won't. So first of all, we have what core gameplay is. Now, core gameplay is distinct from a core experience. Don't worry too much about the terminology here. Think more about the meanings behind them. I'm not necessarily using like industry standard terms, uh, but don't worry about that. Think about gameplay and experience as different things. A core experience is basically, this is sort of the way the game feels overall. That's how it feels to play. And then core gameplay, like a core mechanic or a core gameplay system, is the most the most fundamental thing that makes the game what it is. If you had to distill the game down to a single thing, what would you do? So we're going to apply this to D&D as well, but I'm going to use a video game example, which I don't often do, but I happen to love Elden Ring. And Elden Ring is a very large, very expansive game, and yet... It feels, when you play it, very focused. And the reason it feels very focused is because Elden Ring is about one thing. Now, if I were to ask you, what do you think Elden Ring is about if you had to distill it down to its core thing? You might say something like combat. And you'd be right. Combat is definitely the core of Elden Ring, but you can take that even further because combat is the core of most games. Now, your core gameplay doesn't need to be specifically unique, but in Elden Ring, combat is defined even further by being about dodging. Elden Ring is a game about dodging, right? If you had to distill it down to its most fundamental component, really it would be about dodging. Maybe also something about like reading enemy attacks and stuff like that, but really that little process of, of, of interpreting an enemy attack and then dodging it, that's pretty much the whole game, right? And that applies to Dark Souls, it applies to Bloodborne, it applies not so much to Sekiro. But the Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Demon Souls, and Elden Ring, those, you know, the Souls-like games are games about dodging. So that's how you can think about core gameplay, and that's how I want you to think about core gameplay. The most tiny thing, the tiniest, most fundamental thing where you cut out everything that you possibly can. That's very important because it allows you to stay completely focused and make sure that your core gameplay is super tight when you start. So the second section is about when it's relevant. This is going to be an easy one because the short answer is always. You should always try to be using this core gameplay concept whenever you can. But because I know that that's not super feasible, the way I want you to think about this is in terms of scale. The bigger the project that you're taking on, the more important core gameplay is. Core gameplay becomes your North Star, your guiding principle. It's the thing that everything else is meant to revolve around. So if you nail it, then you can build out of it and you can build out of it without losing focus. And the bigger the project is, the easier it is to lose focus. So even though it's always relevant, whether you're creating a, uh, a module, a completely new tabletop RPG, or a magic item for D&D, and everything in between. It's always relevant, but it becomes more important the bigger the project is. So if you're doing a tabletop RPG, you cannot get away with not having core gameplay defined. You can't. If you're doing a magic item, you probably can. A lot of this comes down to how big is the negative impact if you have an unfocused design and if it's a magic item the impact is pretty low but core gameplay will always make your design better 
having focus will always make your design better, but be judicious with how you use your time, by all means. And that's really all I have to say about when to use it. Always if you can, but make compromises as necessary, I suppose. Okay, now how you use it is one of the more complicated ones. I'm gonna keep it fairly straightforward. And the way you use core gameplay as a concept is you compare it with your core experience. So the way that you want to do that is you want to define your core experience, do about one sentence, and in order to define a good core experience, you want to use experiential language, not emotive language. So what that means is you don't want to say the player should feel clever and tactical because those are very emotional, very abstract. You can bring it down a level by talking about experiences as opposed to emotions. So for example, you could say something like, uh, I want my alchemist class to be all about uh, finding interesting solutions by creating new concoctions, right? So if you have that as your experience, that actually pretty, pretty, I think that sounds good for an alchemist. You may disagree, that's fine. If I was doing an alchemist, that might be how I started. That would be my target experience. My target experience will now inform the core gameplay. So if I'm thinking about what the core gameplay is, now I'm gonna say something like, well, I'm gonna need gameplay that gets players to have that experience. So my starting point for that will probably be lots of little components that come together in various combinations. An immediate problem that would arise is, well, now there's all these different combinations. How in a game like fifth edition are you going to, to make it so that all those combinations don't feel overwhelming? You don't want to just have a giant table of, you know, 8,000 different combinations. That's absurd. But also you don't want everything to be just completely random because then you don't get the experience of purposefully dis uh, combining different chemicals or whatever, right? So the, the, the alchemist, the science of the alchemy would be lost in the gameplay experience. So you see, you see how the core gameplay derives from the core experience. It's intended to achieve the core experience. And in general, you know you're on the right track if your core gameplay by itself is enough to achieve that core experience. Then you know you're really doing well. So that's the basics of how to use it. And finally, we have testing and iteration. Now, the most important thing that I wanna mention here is just that if you're doing a lot of really clear focused work on what the core experience is and what the core gameplay are, then really what you end up with is a, almost a hypothesis. And if you have something that's that clear, which you should because you have a gameplay experience and you have core gameplay and your core gameplay is intended to uh, actually create that core experience. And if the gameplay isn't intended to create that core experience, then guess what? Your first test when you're testing is, does it? And that's what you're looking out for. That's it. And then iteration is, if it doesn't, it won't. How do I make it so that it does? You might wanna change the core experience a little bit. You might wanna change the core gameplay a little bit or both. That's fine. But that's what the iteration and testing process is all about. You can test this for yourself, by the way. You don't necessarily need other play testers. At the earliest stages, you can test it yourself. So, an example of this at play would be uh, if you go and watch my Volomancer class, I have a core experience. I want to create the sense that the player has this overwhelming, overflowing fount of power, but has no control over it. And so a lot of the class is all about how do I exert control over this power. I want to control it. And then the subclasses are all different methods of control. But most importantly, the core gameplay itself, the thing that actually achieves the core experience, is the volatility die. You roll the die, that's the spell you cast if you fail your save. So you have these different methods of, of controlling that magic, but there's always that level of randomness. So you get this sense that the more your ability the, the more you as a player are able to control the randomness in, in concerted and tactical ways, the more effective you are as, as a Volomancer. So that's how it creates that core gameplay and how, it, how that core gameplay specifically creates the core experience. So you, you really wanna be focusing in that way. And remember the volatile die is the mechanic. That's the mechanic. That's the core gameplay is that mechanic. Everything else builds out of that. And 
you really want to be focusing your designs in that way. So anyway, that's the basics of core gameplay and core mechanics. And I hope you will apply this. Please try and let me know. I've tried to keep this brief but practical. That's a very difficult line to balance. It's a very difficult, difficult balance to, to maintain. So I, I, I don't know how successful I've been. But please let me know if you try it and it doesn't work out. Uh, and I'll uh, hopefully get back to you with a new video in less than 60 years. Okay, see ya.